I said it's high time that the church of God step into all that God has called us to be. I mean, these are not the days to be sitting back and waiting. And I mean, these are the days to get out there and use what God has given you. Sharpen up your tools. Amen. Jump in. Amen. Change the world. Amen. Come on. You think, they think, wow, that's a lofty thought. But you've got a world around you every day. Amen. So you can change the world around you. And, and the better you are connected and understanding and and sharpened in the gifts that God's put in you, and even being able to look to Him at any moment for whatever is necessary, the better off we're going to be. Amen. Amen? The better off you're going to be, and the better off I'm going to be. Amen? Because we do know that the gifts are for others. It's to help bless people. Amen? Don't we want to be a blessing to the world? Don't we want to help people? There's nothing like getting up, you know, in the day and going about your day and going to bed at night and just realizing that you just helped somebody. That you just helped somebody get a little further down the road. Praise God. And also, in the use of the gifts, the Bible says that God is glorified. Hallelujah. I mean, as Christians, we're always wanting to glorify God. So, man, when we find out who we are and how God's wired us, it's just a great thing. So, in session one, we discussed uh, an eight-step process to help you discover, develop, and deploy. That means to bring to action, to bring to use, effective use, uh, the gifts that God has put in you. And the first step was very foundational. It was about scripturally studying and understanding the different gifts, all the different gifts that God has given, that Jesus has given, that the Holy Spirit has given. And so we are, in this section of the teaching, we are doing that. Amen? So it's not an exhaustive study, but I am trying to help you get down a little bit along the road so that you can know some things that you need to know. Now we've already covered that the Godhead, Jesus, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three, the Trinity, are involved in giving gifts to us in the earth so that we can get our job done. All right? So don't turn there. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, we see that. And so in verse 4, it says that there are diversities of gift but the same Spirit. Verse 5, there are differences of ministries but the same Lord. And then in verse 6, there are diverse, uh, diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. And so we've done some study on, on the things that God has put in the body, in believers, in people in general. We've done some study on the gifts that Jesus has put in the church. And now we are studying the gifts or the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that are talked about there in verse 4. So turn with me to your Bible over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and hold your place there. Just give a little recap in case we have anybody that hadn't been here for the last three weeks. Uh, but we are talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so again, just, just to let you know, there is a difference Gifts of the Holy Spirit is not being led by the Spirit, which should be operating in every believer at all times, at all, in all aspects of life. Being led has to do primarily with generally a general sense of knowing some things. Do this, don't do that, uh, take this job, don't take that job. It might even... It might even branch into doing something about someone else. You might make up, wake up one morning and sense that you ought to call so-and-so. That's not a gift of the Spirit. That's just a leading. Amen? And so I want to say this, that the leadings are supernatural. And so we don't minimize the leadings. We're not just, you know, I just want to operate in the gifts. The, the truth is you'll be more effective in operating in, in the gifts when you're effective in being led by the Spirit. That is the primary goal of every believer is to know well enough the voice of God and the leadings of God, all the different ways that He leads us so that we can follow Him because it is the role and the job of the Holy Spirit to get us into our inheritance. Amen. Come on, did you know we have an inheritance, praise God? Come on, some things happened at the cross and I want to take full access of everything that God has given me. Listen, and the only one that knows it, the Bible says the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. He knows the will of God, the ways of God. And He's the one that guides us into what, he, what Jesus has laid hold of for us. Amen. Amen. So if you're looking for a healing, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to guide you into that healing. If you're looking for prosperity, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to give you ways and things to do to get you into the fullness of what God has for you. Alright? But the leadings are not 
what we call, the, what the Bible calls the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, okay? The nine manifestations are a bit more precise. It's, it's a precise endowment at a precise moment, and it's usually very specific. And so I would term it this way, is that it's like an extra measure of something. And it happens just at a moment, for a moment, for a certain something, and then it's gone. Whereas the leading, the leadings of God are always with us. Amen? So tonight we're going to give, we're going to continue on studying some things. or We're going to give some scriptural accounts, uh, some possibilities. Because I do want to say that due to the nature of of how the Holy Spirit operates in these things, it's not always exactly clear in the Scripture what was used or what was happening at the moment when a particular event took place. You know, many times a healing happens, but it doesn't say through the manifestation of the gifts of healing. It doesn't say through the, the manifestation of the working of miracles. It doesn't say special faith came upon Paul. It doesn't say that. And so because it doesn't say that, we don't really know because it is a moment of something with the Holy Spirit. All right, but I will try to give you some of my own personal experiences where I do absolutely know what gift manifested at that moment and how it felt so that that will help you. But we will see from the scripture that maybe some possibilities of this is what's happening here. All right, are we ready? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> let's, lead the, uh, let's read the scripture here of the nine manifestations or gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Do you see that? The, the gifts profit. There's a profit. There's a perfect. There's a purpose. They do something. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. So these gifts or these manifestations are given by the Holy Spirit for a moment when a need pops up, when someone is looking to God to be a blessing, to be a help to someone. So they are distributed as the Spirit wills. All right, so that the Holy Spirit, He is the possessor, He is the owner, and He is the distributor of the gifts. So these are not gifts that we own, that we can choose to operate in at any time. They come upon for a moment, and then they depart again. Praise God. So let's look at how we're going to divide these out. This is just for ease of studying these out. Number one, three categories here of the nine gifts. Number one, revelation gifts. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. Okay, the revelation gifts reveal something. Aha, aha, revelation reveals something. They supernaturally reveal or make known something and cause a person to see or know a truth about another individual or a situation. The other category, number two, is the power gifts. This is faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healing. The power gifts do something. They supernaturally cause someone to do or accomplish something supernatural. Number three, the utterance gifts. Uh, a lot of times they're called the vocal gifts or the inspirational gifts, prophecy, uh, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. The utterance gifts say something. Praise the Lord. They supernaturally cause the speaking of words that edify, exhort, and comfort the hearer. So last week we started out talking about uh, the category of the revelation gifts, and we got through uh, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. So tonight we're going to pick up on studying the discerning of spirits. So the discerning of spirits gives supernatural insight at a moment into the spirit world. You know, there is a spirit world all around us. There are angels, there are demons, there are there's supernatural activity going on at all times. To discern means to perceive. It means to know, to recognize something. And in the discerning of the spirit, the perception usually comes through seeing or hearing in the spirit. So it's something of the senses in the spirit. 
Uh, I say that because usually seeing and hearing, but it can be other things. It can be a feeling. You know, I've had angels touch my hands before. I've smelt a demon. One time I was dealing with someone, or this was early, early, early on. I was dealing with someone and trying to help them, and I was trying to figure out. They were saying this weird something or another, and I was just pondering, you know, where is this coming from? You know, is this wrong or whatever? And all of a sudden, as they were talking, I smelled in the spirit. It was the wildest thing. I mean, the most foul, putrid, and I knew at that moment when I smelled it that there was an evil spirit, and that was what was causing this something. And I cast it out, and it, it left. Amen? So, so it's perceiving or knowing in the spirit, usually through sight or hearing or touch or, or some spiritual sense like that. It is uh, seeing in the realm of the spirit, the spirit world, with the ability to detect angels, demons, and to sometimes know the condition of the human spirit. Uh, now this gift, of course, is a little more limited in range because it deals with one class, and that is only spirits. Uh, unlike the word of knowledge, which you can get a word of knowledge about all kinds of stuff, but if, it's, if this is not where you're discerning an angel or a demon or something of the spiritual realm, then it would not fall into the category of discerning of spirits. Uh, this also, this gift also can help you sometimes uh, distinguish when something is going on. What is the, the source behind what's happening, the behavior, the words? And that was a good example of, of the time I told you I was dealing with the, uh, with the girl. Discerning of spirits is not, everybody listen to this, it is not discernment. Every believer should have discernment. Inside every believer, they have discernment because the Holy Spirit lives in, in them. So we are to get familiar with discernment. Discernment is knowing whether something is uh, true or false, right or wrong, good or evil. You know, so you might be hearing something and, and it's not right doctrinally. And you, you discern, you perceive, you know that that's not right doctrine. It's, it's got a scratchy feeling. It's not feeling right. That's discernment, but it's not the gift of discerning, discerning of spirits. It's not, it's not the same, okay? So it's very important that we know that and understand that, <clears throat> that we discern by the inward witness, so by the inward witness within us, and we discern, of course, by agreement with the Word of God. Discerning of spirits is also not a kind of spiritual mind reading, okay? It's not a power to discern the faults of others, it's not even getting near someone and sensing that something is wrong with them, but maybe they're sad. That would be a leading of the Holy Spirit. That would be discerning or perceiving something spiritually, but it's not the gift of the discerning of spirits. So let's look at a couple of, uh, let's look at a good example. This, this is absolutely a true example. Turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to give you a small account of what goes on here so that as we read it, you can understand where we're headed toward. But this is the account of the Apostle John. Uh, when he, it said that he got into the Spirit, he was praying one day and he said he was in the Spirit and it said a door opened up in the heavens. So he was actually in the Spirit and he actually saw into the heavenly realm. It said he saw the throne of God and it says this in verse 5, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of the fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So what John saw... What he discerned in the Spirit was actually the Holy Spirit as seven spirits which represent God and who God is. And it helped John to know from where what he was saw was coming. So he perceived and saw heavenly activity, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit representing the seven spirits of God. Okay, we also have another account. This is just a possibility. I don't want you to turn there. Just listen. This is a, a possible, this could be a discerning of spirits. We know the account in Acts chapter 16 uh, where Paul was in a city and he had a girl uh, that was a fortune teller and she was following him around and she was making declarations. These are the servants of the Most High God. You know, and what she was saying sounded okay. 
I mean, these are the certain, she wasn't like saying, you know, these are weird people, don't listen. But the Bible says that Paul, after being grieved or annoyed for several days, he turned around to her, perceiving, recognizing that she had a divination, a spirit of divination in her, and he cast it out. So it's possible that the reason that it, even though it was kind of annoying Paul, the reason that possibly he didn't deal with it for three days is because possibly he didn't know for three days. Now, what I don't know is whether he had a leading of the Spirit and whether he just sensed that this girl had a devil or whether he really had a manifestation of the discerning of spirits. But it's possible. So this would be one of those possibilities where you see that in operation. Also, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Let's look at this account. This again is just a possibility, uh, but we certainly see where something of the demonic realm uh, was perceived or understood or known. So again, this is the account of Jesus and the man uh, of the Gadarenes, Mark chapter 5. We're going to read in verse 1. And uh, this, this revealed to Jesus uh, what was the spirit or the power that was behind the behavior of this man. So Mark chapter 1 verse 5, we're going to read through verse 10. It says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, the city, the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, Jesus, had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Okay, now you remember, this is giving an account, so it doesn't mean that Jesus knew instantly. It's just telling us that it was a man that had an unclean spirit. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even the chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always day and night he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? Now here we actually hear the devil speak. We, we hear the devil, the, the demon that is in this man actually speak. And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. So what you see here are several things. It does not say that Jesus got off the boat and instantly knew there was a man in the city that lived this way and that he was... It doesn't say that. What it does say was that instantly when he got out of the boat, there was a man that came running to him of afar, for he had said, come out of him unclean spirit. So it's possible that Jesus, when Jesus could see him, that there was a manifestation of the discerning of spirits, and he saw that the man had a devil, and he commanded that the unclean spirit come out of him. Could be. Could be just that he got near the man and had a word of knowledge. But it's possible. But we certainly see that Jesus had knowledge into the demonic realm and what was dealing with him, even to the point of asking the devil something and the devil speaking back to him. Yeah, pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. This stuff is really, really, really real. Really real. <laughs> you know, one time, I, uh, here's a personal example. Uh, one time I was dealing with someone uh, very early in the church days and uh, I had had her coming for counseling uh, or to help her, she was having some issues, sweet as could be, sweet, sweet person, um, but just some things that were off and some things that needed to be addressed. And so I had her coming in the office and I was working with her and, you know, I would, I would come out of the meetings with her and I would think, you know, wow, I mean, she, she would say all the right things, know all the right things, but just I couldn't place my finger on what was wrong with her. And one thing I want to tell you is you don't want to try to be casting a devil out of somebody when there is no devil. Because if there is no devil, then there is nothing that's subject to the name of Jesus through you and you're going to be convincing someone they have a devil that they don't have and then you're going to be making them think that they, they can't get free and then having the devil becomes the excuse. I mean, I have met people that have, quote, devils that nobody can get rid of. And, you know, so you can't be telling someone they have a devil and just assuming no matter how weird their behavior is, these things must be discerned spiritually either by the leading of the Spirit, by regular discernment, or by a gift, you must know. 
So one day she was at the office with me and uh, we had been meeting and I was still thinking, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I was doing the best I could do. I would pray for her. Uh, but I had not really known that she had a devil. And uh, we got up to take a break. And I went into the restroom and uh, she went to the restroom, excuse me, and she was washing her hands. And as I walked by, she had the door open and she was washing her hands. As I walked by uh, the door, I heard a voice. And it, it said something, but what it said, which was a normal sentence, it was a normal sentence, but it was not her voice. It was the voice of a devil. I, how I knew it was the voice of a devil, it was just, you know, when you meet the devil, a devil, you know it's the voice of a devil. It was the weirdest, very manipulative, very perverted voice. And it shocked me because as I walked by, I heard this, and I went like this, and I looked back because it came from where she was. And so she was speaking out of her own voice, but I was hearing what she said in the voice of the devil, a devil. I knew then she had a devil. And so, praise God, because now I knew how to help her. I mean, let's just cut to the chase. And so she came in the office, and I just said, Listen, you are dealing with the devil, you know, and we're going to fix it. So praise God. See, the gifts are purposeful. It's not just to say, Wow, I heard a devil, and I'm just going to keep on walking. No, if you're sensing something, listen, listen. If you're sensing something, and it's of God, if it's of God, if it's not something you're doing in your flesh, if it's not something of the devil where he's having a familiar fear, spirit or other things which we're not going to go into tonight, but if you're hearing something from God, there is a purpose in it. And you will either have authority to address it, help them, or you will feel such a burden to pray. And when you pray, there will be an entry into the spirit where you connect with God in such a powerful way. Amen. So that's a great, a great example of the discerning of spirits. Okay? <clears throat> of course, you know, angels work the same way. Sometimes you, uh, you, you can see them. Sometimes they help. They, sometimes they show up for me. They show up sometimes in the healing ministry. Sometimes they touch my hand. Sometimes things happen. And it, hel it helps me. It helps me to know that they are there to assist. And I will say this, that... Uh, the discerning of spirits often works uh, with the gift of faith. And I, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later and how that really works. So I'm going to skip over now mentioning anything about familiar spirits which are not of God uh, and do actually work and operate in, in people and even Christian people. And we'll see if we have time tonight. Maybe I'll go back uh, through them. But <clears throat> there is the true manifestation of the gift of the spirit of discerning of spirits where we actually know and are able to help people get free and able to do the things that God needs done. Amen? So let's move on to the power gifts. Let's talk about uh, the gift of faith here. <clears throat> uh, the gift, now remember, the power gifts do something. Okay, so the gift of faith is a supernatural manifestation. Remember, a manifestation. It's that for a moment. It's like an extra measure of an ability. It's an extra, it's like something plops on you for a moment to do something, okay? And this is known as special faith. So let me just say here, there are four kinds of faith or four terminologies of faith that you see in the Bible. One would be a saving faith, the faith that you have when you got saved to receive, to acknowledge who Jesus is. There's a saving faith. Then there's a general faith. The Bible says that we all have the measure of faith, all right? As a saved person, we all have a measure of faith, of course, that can be grown, of course, that can be exercised. There is also faith in faithfulness, which is a fruit of the Spirit, okay? All those are different from the fourth type, which is the manifestation of faith or special faith. <clears throat> this is a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit whereby a worker or a believer is empowered with a special faith or a wonder-working faith, removing all and any doubt. It's like a cloak that comes on one, making one feel invincible. And at that moment, you're able to receive, 
to receive something. You receive something from God that helps you be able to do something. So usually the, the gift of faith in that measure is a something that comes upon you to, you re, to help you receive what you need from God to do this something. Okay, so this is a gift to believers in order that he might receive miracles, that he receives an extra extraordinary ability to overcome an obstacle, uh, to do something. So let's look at a couple of uh, possible examples of this. I'm not going to have you turn to these. I'm just going to talk about these. Um, one would be uh, in Acts chapter 12. This is the account where Peter is in prison and he is scheduled to be beheaded in the morning. Okay. Now, how many of you, if you were scheduled to be beheaded in the morning, would be found totally sound, asleep, in your bed, with a total peace at night? That is a special grace. That is an ability from God. All right, so that's a good example of that, Acts chapter 12, verse 6 through 11. Another example of a special faith, it appears, is when Jesus in Mark chapter 12 was in the back of the boat and literally the storm was raging. They say it was like hurricane uh, force type wind. The boat was rocking, the waves were coming in, and Jesus was asleep. Not even laying there thinking, are these disciples going to get up and do something with it? I mean, he was asleep, perfectly asleep in the midst of a storm. That's very possible that that also is a, a manifestation of special faith. Uh, we see the account in Acts chapter 9 where Peter uh, raises uh, Tabitha from the dead. So special faith is when something comes upon someone and for a moment... They feel invincible that there is not one single obstacle that can stand in their way and prevent them from doing whatever it is that needs to get done. Okay? It's very different from saying, okay, I know the authority that's in the Word of God. I know the power that's in the name of Jesus. And because of that, I'm going to lay hands on somebody. It's like a something drops on you. I remember, the, I remember the first time I had this happen to me in a measure like that that was a, really a special gift of faith. I was overseas and I was ministering and I had begun to move out into the people. The people, I think they had thrown all their chairs against the wall. There were like 300 of them and they were just out and I was just going in the crowd and all of a sudden this lady got in front of me and she, I don't know what all she said to me, but the gist of what she said was that she had been trying to have a baby and she couldn't have a baby. And that's, that's all I heard. And when she said that, okay, something came on me. It wasn't like I had been praying for a lot of people. And, and good, good stuff, we'd had people delivered of arthritis. We'd had all kinds of stuff going on. But this was different. It was like at that moment, I absolutely, something came on me. Oh, no, no. And I just grabbed her hands and I shouted. Okay? Now, it's possible that the shout might have, get, might have been a working of miracles. But what came on me, instead of me just taking her hands and saying, let me pray for you, I mean, it came, something came on me. And there was not anybody that was going to convince me that she was not going to have a baby. So her story was for 12 years. All the doctors, she and her husband, neither one, they told them it was medically impossible. They had done all of the treatments, all of the in vitro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when I went back, 12 months later, she had a three-month-old baby. Praise God. That she had named Miracle. And I'm just telling you, it was something that came on me. It's different. It's different even from having faith and, and knowing the Word, knowing I'm going to pray for... It's different. It's just a something that comes on you. I mean, and if we could take control of it, boy, I'd, I'd, take, I'd, I'd wear it everywhere I went, praise God. But it doesn't happen like that. Now, remember I told you that sometimes the special gift of faith works with... with in the devil area of discerning of spirits. And it's because sometimes when you're dealing with the devil, we know the authority that's in the name of Jesus, but you also know that the person that you're dealing with, there's parameters with them. Are they believing in faith? Are they really hanging on to something? There's all kind of things. So you're doing your best, absolutely, to use the name of Jesus and the authority and the power, but there's, there's not an absolute 
a surety every time that it's going to work depending on what they're doing. But one time I, again, was overseas in a place and I was walking down a line and it was a healing line and I, I had ministered to a girl and, you know, I just ministered to her and I, I thought everything was fine and I went down the line and I turned around and she was back at me in the line and she was clutching at my clothes and stuff. And so when I turned around to her, I perceived, I would not say, I would not say it was a, a discerning of spirits because I didn't see the spirit. I didn't hear the spirit. The spirit didn't manifest in that way. But I would say that I had a leading of the Lord. And I knew when I turned and looked at her that this was something else and she had a devil. And I knew that I couldn't get her healed until I dealt with the devil. Okay, now that was probably a word of knowledge. But what happened is when I began to say something to her and find out a little bit about it and talk to her, then, then it happened at one moment because she was like, she, her mother was in the occult. She was scared that her mother's putting spells on her. She didn't have really much knowledge of the Word of God. She certainly didn't understand the authority. And so the first few things I tried saying, okay, I was trying to build her faith, connect with her, but then it happened. I mean, something came on me, and I was like, oh, mm -mm. At this point, it didn't matter who she was, what she thought, whether she believed, whether she didn't. I mean, it was like me and the devil is coming out. Amen. And I'm telling y'all what, I, I, I call it this way. It's, it was a special faith that came on me at that moment. And I got up in her face and it was like me and the devil. <laughs> and it's coming out. I mean, it just came on me. I mean, if anybody would have tried to stop me at that point... It, it might have gotten ugly. It was that, it's that, that's what happens when a, it's a manifestation of the Spirit. It's not a normal, I've cast many devils out, grabbing someone's hand, using the name of Jesus. Absolutely, but it's different. It's different when, when, there's, when, when there's that measure that happens. Praise the Lord. I will say this, you know, I was working with her. And see, that's how the gifts operate sometimes. Sometimes you've got to give God something to work with. You've got to use some of your own faith before special faith is going to come. You, I mean, you've got you to get determined that you're going to get a miracle for somebody before the gift of miracles comes on you. So, so get in there, man. Give it all you got. Yep. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said that it will take, uh, once that you take a step of ordinary faith, when you come to the end of the faith, then often this supernatural gift of faith will take over. Yes. I mean, Smith Wigglesworth knew some stuff about, about, I believe, special faith. Anytime you raise someone from the dead like Peter did with Tabitha, Tabitha in Acts chapter 9, anytime there, there is a manifestation of the gift of faith, because no matter how much we love people and we want... It, it, there's something, there's an extra special measure of something that happens when people are raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's move on to the working of miracles. Also a power gift. A miracle can be defined as a, listen to this, a supernatural intervention of God in the ordinary course of nature. So this manifestation gives the ability to cause a supernatural miracle to happen for people by a command, a declaration, or an act of faith. The working of miracles intervenes to make something happen. Now this is not what people, you know, people term things miracles all the time. You know, childbirth is a miracle. Yeah, in creation of childbirth, it's a miracle. But for a child to be born every day, it's not a miracle. Yeah. For a person to be saved, it's supernatural. But it's not, it's not a miracle like it's something that never happens in the course of stuff. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so use your, I say this because be careful with your words. Don't be terming things miracles that aren't really miracles. Miracles are, are of God and they're very special to God. Let's read the account here in uh, John chapter 2. Is that the one I want to do? I think that's a good one. Yeah, let's read this account real quickly. This is where Jesus turns the water to wine. That would be a miracle. For water to be in a cup at one moment or to be in a barrel for one moment and the next moment it to be completely full of wine. I would, I would qualify that as a miracle. That is an intervention out of the ordinary course. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you, how much you pour Kool-Aid. It doesn't matter how many grapes you squeeze at that moment. It, you know, we, we went from water to wine. A miracle took place. So John chapter 2 verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in the Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I love that. And his mother said, to, she just totally ignored him. She just totally went on. She just said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. See, she was expecting a miracle here. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some of them now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, we didn't say when they were drunk, church. We didn't say when they were drunk. We said when they were well drunk. In other words, when they had some to drink, okay, then the inferior, but you have kept the good wine until now. And this was the beginning of signs that Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. Now, it's possible, again, we don't absolutely know because we don't know what happened at that moment with the Holy Spirit. But it's possible that as the mother was saying, okay, hey, just whatever they say, do. Jesus began looking to the Lord, wanting to help, wanting to be a blessing. Gift manifest. Amen? Yep. Another example of this would be when Jesus uh, fed the multitudes. Definitely a miracle. Could be a working of a miracle. Could be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Just could be Jesus using the name and the authority that God had given him in the earth. That's the cool thing is what I want you to know. We have authority. Amen. We, we can get things by the authority of God's Word, by the power that's in the name of Jesus, by, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We can make things happen. Those are different. But there's just an extra something sometimes that comes on you. And usually when it comes, it's necessary and it's needed. Amen. A good example of this would be uh, in Russia one time, uh, in my first trip there, I was having a healing service. And I think this was like Sunday. And we had been there like five days and done a bunch of meetings. And uh, there had been a guy and he was ushering. The whole time I was there, he had been helping with the ushering. A real sweet guy. And, but he had a real, a real bad limp. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like just a limp. I mean, it was like a, you know, a big limp. And I had noticed it, but, you know, he hadn't asked me to pray. I hadn't really thought that much about it. Well, I was in the healing line and ministering to people, and all of a sudden I just I caught him out of the corner of my eye. And when I caught him out of the corner of my eye, just something just inside me, I thought... I can get a miracle for him. That, that, that's how it felt. I can get a miracle for him. I, so I asked him what was wrong, and he had been born this way. He had been born with one leg four inches shorter than the other leg. Okay? And so I just, when he said it, I just said to him, well, God's going to do a miracle for you. And I had him sit on the stage, and I had the people come up. People were everywhere. And, and just use the name of Jesus, and his leg, boom. I mean, it just went, zoop. His leg just came straight, and he jumped up. He jumped up off that stage and began running. Praise the Lord. Just, just a word. No way could I do that. No way could I do that. I mean, I, you know, would I like to all the time? Yeah. But I mean, just something in a moment. And I just knew that God was going to do the miracle. It wasn't, like I, it wasn't like I was invincible feeling like, no, it was just like I knew God was going to do the miracle. And the miracle happened. Praise the Lord. Many times you'll see the... Uh, Many times you'll see the, the working of miracles work with the gift of faith. Uh, again, in raising a dead person, there's the special faith that makes one feel like they can actually pray. I mean, Smith Wigglesworth went to a funeral one time, grabbed a man out of the coffin, grabbed him up out of the coffin, a dead body, and threw him against the wall. That is special faith. No one in their right mind does that. Well, when he threw that body against the wall, guess what happened? That body, uh, you know, uh, decayed, ugly. It had been going to deteriorate. There wasn't anything working. There was no blood, nothing. I mean, we're talking dead as dead as dead can be. And well, when he threw that body against the wall, boom, the manifestation of the working of miracles brought back to life. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I am looking... For, for the raising from the dead. I'm ready. I'm ready. 
So, anyway, I have a good story of, of the gift of faith and the working of a miracle taking place together. Show you how these two kind of connect together. Um, again, one time I was at a meeting and uh, a lady came up to me. Most of you have heard this story, but I want to tell you how, how it felt at the moment. She came up running up to me, uh, speaking her language, saying something, and so my translator was saying to me, uh, she lost her ring, she lost her ring, she lost her ring. And so when she would say that, she lost her ring. Now, this was just by leading of the Spirit. I would hear the Holy Spirit say, and she would say, is it a sign? She lost her ring, is it a sign? And I would say, no. And she lost her ring, is it a sign? No, I mean, we must have done this two or three times, and I'm just standing there. And then all of a sudden, it happened. I mean, again, something came on me. Now I know it to be special faith. Something came on me. And I mean, it just came on me. And I, outside of the parameters of my own thinking, my own thinking about what's going on, I took her hands and I said to her, these were my exact words, I remember them so distinctly. I said to you, I can get your ring back. You know why I said that? Because the gift of faith was on me. At that moment, I had not even conceptualized how a ring that was lost, it was not, it was just, I was, it was invincible. At that moment, I could, I could do something. And it came out of my mouth, thank God, before my mind ever thought about it, because I had thought about it, I would have just said, well, I hope you find it. It's probably, <laughs> seriously, seriously, that's probably what I, what I would have said. But it came on me. And I grabbed her and I said, I can get your ring back. And then what happened is in that moment, I, I worked a miracle because I remember commanding wasn't just like that. Was I commanded. I took authority in the time realm. I reversed time. I said something to the angel. It, boom. And then it lifted. I mean, as soon as it had come, it was gone. <laughs> And once it was gone, I was left with the reality of what I had just said and what I had just done. And so I'm backing up and I'm thinking, God, what did I just do? You know, because in the moment, you're not analyzing, oh, that was, you know, you get more familiar with these things as they go on. But, you know, I was stepping back thinking, oh, I hope not to me, you know, Lord. Well, so she walks back to her chair and sitting in the middle of her chair, her ring. Which she had lost the day before at work. So it wasn't like she had lost it in the church house and somebody had gone outside and found it and put, put it in her chair. Amen? That's a miracle. Amen. The special gift of faith to me to even think that I could do that. But then it was the working of the miracle, the command that I gave that made that miracle happen. And praise God, the church went crazy. And I was just so thankful. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Yeah, here was the deal. It, the sign was is that her husband was trying to divorce her. And so she had thought that maybe her losing her ring was a sign. Remember another one of those that were not led by fleeces, were not led by outward things? No, it was not a sign at all. Okay, let's move on here to the, another power gift, the gifts of healings. Gift of healings, notice that's plural, is a special manifestation of God's power to heal a sick person at a moment of time. It's a supernatural momentary power to eliminate a particular sickness or disease, okay? Because again, praise God, the Bible says that every believer is going to lay hands on the, on the sick and the sick are going to recover. So what we're talking about here are, are gifts that are different from using faith. They're different from just using the authority that's in the Word or in the name, okay? This is a special, it comes upon at a moment to eradicate a particular sickness or disease. And again, it's like a cloak that kind of comes on you. And sometimes you can feel like you get into a, a groove with, with uh, and usually it, it has to do with something specific or a specific type of a, like Dr. Dufresne, the Lord, you know, the Lord appeared to him one time and, and told him, he said, I'm giving you an endowment to deal with cancer. And he had, now he couldn't make it manifest all the time, but he, what he would be faithful with what he knew. He would always call cancer people up and give a chance. And, it, and if the gift didn't manifest, at least he was still praying for them with everything he had, using the name of Jesus, with every ounce of faith he had. But sometimes and many times, the gift would manifest. Okay? For me, it happened in the very early on with headaches. 
I mean, it was just, I, it, anywhere I went, I could get people healed of headaches. Just, it was just so supernatural. Not like regular, but just supernatural in, in that area. I know that Brother Hagen said that uh, in his days, one of the things that operated a lot through the gifts of healings for him was uh, hernias, lumps, uh, tumors, growth, things that would grow in people. He had great success with those. And it just probably some type of a special ability. And that's why it takes everybody in the body because the gifts of healings usually targets a specific thing. And so it's not that, that just a general gift can fix everything. It's that this one gift at that moment fixes this one thing. And so you see that, you know, uh, Dr. Dufresne has a, an ability in this area and Kenneth Hagin had an ability in this area and I have an ability in this area. And so when we all come together, praise God, all the believers together coming together, making room for God, praise God, every manner of sickness and every manner of disease must go in Jesus' name. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> it is not the medical profession or anything to do with natural or medical remedies or expertise, or expertise, nor is it healing by general faith or just believing. Okay, now let me say something right here. Everybody lift your hands. Praise God for doctors. Praise God for medical science. Praise God for the discoveries and the things that have been made and known that help people, certainly people outside the body but even when we need it, okay? So God is not mad at people about the medical industry, all right? But we do need to be aware of what is a miracle with God and what is a healing by medicine. Thank God if we're, if we're asking God to help and we're expecting the medicine to praise the Lord for that, okay? But it's not the same as... A healing that comes from God where there is no medical treatment. There is no... If you get a surgery and the surgery goes well, thank God that the surgery went well. But let's not call that a miracle of God. Now, now if the doctor tells you that it's going to take uh, three months for your arm to get well and, and, and you pray after the surgery and within a week you're like, you know... Okay, we can call that, we can call that recovery supernatural. See what I'm saying? So, you know, okay? But there is no condemnation in Christ. There is none. So you taking an aspirin at a t time if you need it, or you doing something that's medically necessary to get yourself in a place where if you're going to believe God, you can believe God, it's okay. God is not mad. God wants us all to live and to be healthy. Amen. Amen. So possibly, now this is a possibility, we don't really know, but possibly uh, John and Peter at the gate, beautiful with the lame man. This might be a good example uh, of a gift of healing. Remember the guy said he was lame from his mother's womb and he sat at the, at the temple begging for alms. And, and so he looked upon them. Remember he looked upon them, he needed something. And so they said, gold and silver we don't have, but what we do have, we give you in the name of Jesus. And it says they took him by the hand and, and said, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They took him and lifted him up and it said that his ankles and his legs gained strength and he began walking and praising the Lord. Hallelujah. So it's possible. It's possible at that moment that there was, and why do I say that? Because they walked by him every day to the temple. You do know that it was God's idea to institute the church and you do know that Jesus and the believers and the disciples and the apostles, you do know they went to church, right? They didn't just sit in their house, I got a relationship with Jesus and everything's wonderful. They did attend. They did go to the synagogue. They did go uh, really a lot more than we, than we go. So they did go. But they passed by this man every day. They passed by him every day. But this day something special happened. Okay, it's possible that that would be uh, gifts, of he gifts of healings. I, I think if you look at Jesus' ministry, it's quite evident in the Bible that Jesus had some special things that he dealt with a lot. He was very great success with blind eyes. Do you know how many accounts in the Bible of Jesus healing blind eyes? I mean, you know, the Bible says that he healed all manners of sickness and all manners of diseases, but it talks specifically several times about blind eyes, deaf ears. So it's possible that Jesus operated in the gifts of healing in that area sometimes. Praise God. All right, well, let's move on. We're going to move on to the utterance gifts or the vocal gifts. 
With the, get these gifts, we witness the remarkable power of words that are anointed and inspired by the Holy Ghost. So let's talk about the first gift, which is the gift of prophecy. Okay, prophecy is divinely inspired utterance. It's speaking forth the words of God, the thoughts, the intents, the purposes, the, what God is saying right here at this moment in a known tongue by the Holy Spirit at a moment with the purpose of bringing a fresh message from heaven to bless and encourage people. Prophecy brings exhortation, edification, and comfort. We'll talk about those words in just a moment. It is forth-telling. Okay? It is foretelling, telling what is. It is not foretelling, going into the future and predicting. Okay? So prophecy is foretelling, telling what is. What it is not is a leading of the Spirit, nor speaking of from your heart, kind of feeling like, it feels good. You know, the Bible says that we're going to open up our mouth and our words are going to be seasoned with salt. We're going to have words that are going to impart grace to the hearer. It's not the same thing. We all have that and should operate in that. Praise God and bless people and help people all the time. But this is different. This is a something, it's, it's almost like just a, a prophecy. The word, when you really define it, means to bubble up, to gush out. So it's just something that comes. It just, just wants to come and it's a divine utterance what God, if, if God was here in the flesh, what God would say at that precise moment. Okay? So that's what prophecy is. Yep. It means to bubble forth, to let drop, to lift up, to tumble forth, to spring forth. Prophecy is always given. Listen, we live in New Testament. We are not in the Old Testament. We do not, test, we do not prophesy like Old Testament prophets. We do not act like Old Testament prophets. Okay, We are not living in the day of judgment and condemnation and, and all these things. It's not, it's not the dispensation that we live in. We live in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit whereby we're loving one another, encouraging one another, where mercy is triumphing over judgment. And so prophecy, actual prophecy from God today, always, everybody say always, always, always edifies, exhorts, and comforts. And that's what it tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, chapter 3. To edify means to build up or to strengthen. So when something is coming from heaven, it's to build up or to strengthen. To exhort means to courage or to call one nearer to God, to, to invite them. It's to kind of lift them up, give them an oomph. And to comfort means a coming alongside to give strength or to give peace, to cheer, to console. It's not just a come along and patting on the back. It's something supernatural that would cause one to know that God has come alongside them and things, things are going to be okay. Things are going to get better. Amen. Amen. Comfort does not include correction or conviction. I'm going to say that again. Comfort. And New Testament prophecy does not include correction or conviction. So when people walk in and start telling you that they're sent of God as a prophet or they operate in the spirit or the prophecy and they're going to prophesy doom and gloom or they're going to tell you everything that's wrong with you and what needs to happen in the church, it's not from God. That's not how God does it. It's not from God. They may have good motives. They may love God. They may even have, have a gift, but that's not prophecy. According to the Scripture... We are going to stick to the Scripture, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, just very quickly, sometimes I hear it said, you know, that when people preach, they're prophesying it's inspired from God. That's not the same. It's not the same as, as something coming from your spirit. It's not the same as having a leading to say something. It's a something that stops you in the, in the mid-sentence or the mid-thought of where you are. And as best as I can just describe it, it's just that extra measure of something again. And it's like something's got to come out. And most of the time, you don't know here. Like you might have one word. You might just sense a something. Okay? But, it, but you do. You do. It is different. It's, it's, it's just different. It's a different word. And the moment it comes out, if people are sharp spiritually, they can discern it. Like I can always discern when someone is prophesying versus when someone is giving a good message. You know, most of the time they'll say, and God says to help people know, but it is a divine utterance at a moment for a specific purpose to say something that God wants said. Are we getting that? 
Uh, there are a lot of instructions in the Bible about the utterance gifts because these are the one gifts that people, uh, it's, it's more easy to manipulate, it's more easy to get in the flesh and say something that you think it's God and you're not, you know, it's really of your, of your flesh or something that comes out of the soul or whatever it may be. So there's a lot of instruction in the Bible about, about the utterance gifts. Uh, we see in uh, Acts chapter 21 where uh, the evangelist uh, Philip's daughters, all it says was that the man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. All right, so prophecy. There are different levels of prophecy, different types of prophecy. I did a whole series over there. I think it's four CDs on prophecy. If you haven't listened to it, it would be great for you to listen to. But it's not prophecy of the scripture. All right, it's not, there's a difference in general prophecy versus the gift of prophecy. General prophecy is what we should all have a fresh testimony of Jesus and what he's done on our lips at all times. There's a difference in the office of the prophet. So there's different levels, but here we're talking about the actual manifestation where an utterance comes from God at a moment. All right? Then, second type of utterance gift is the divers of tongues or the different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now these two uh, gifts are distinctive to the church age uh, and they were not operating when Jesus was in the earth. Do we know why? It's because the Holy Spirit had not been given yet. The Holy Spirit had not been poured out, and tongues is the direct evidence of the initial pouring. So if the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out yet, Jesus was not allowed to give evidence of the outpouring that had not taken place yet. Plus, plus Jesus, because he was completely sinless and completely stood upright before God, perfect communion with God, he didn't need tongues to communicate with God, but we do. Amen? Come on, the Bible says when we pray in tongues, all kind of heavenly divine secrets, we, we pray the will of God, we tap into all kind of woo stuff. Praise the Lord. All right, so that's different than this, but I'm just saying tongues is a dispensation of this era. All right, so divers of tongues is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in a language never heard by the speaker nor understood by the speaker and... It's, so it's not your own natural tongue. Maybe you're bilingual. Maybe you can speak Spanish. I've been overseas before and I'd be like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you, is that tongues or is that... Don't say anything you know because, you know, you can't fool me. <laughs> but it comes in a supernatural, it's a heavenly language as the Spirit gives utterance and it usually manifests in the midst of the assembly or in the midst of people. Listen, in the midst of the four of you talking together, there can be a manifestation of the Spirit. I remember just in Trinidad, we were recently in Trinidad with the team, and uh, we had a, it was the, like the first day that we got there, and there was hardly anybody there. I think there might have been like 12 people in the room, and we were just praying and seeking God, and I was just praying, and you know, we had the team there, and we were praying and seeking God, and I was praying, and, and I felt it. I, I felt it. I felt it coming on me. I knew it was coming. I knew I was fixing to have uh, tongues, divers of tongues, tongues for an interpretation. I knew it. And so I leaned over to pastor and I, he was sitting on the, sitting on the thing praying and I said, hey, I got a tongue. Do you, do you have the thing? And he kind of looked at me like this and I thought, okay, you don't have it. And so I paced for a minute, but I'm like, oh no, it's coming. It's coming. And right before I said it, I knew the Lord just let me know who had the interpretation. And so I knew who was going to interpret it. And I, I just stood up. And here I had been. I'd been praying in tongues and worshiping. And we'd been carrying on with God. But all of a sudden I stopped in a lot. And it changed. My tongue changed. It, it came as a direct utterance at that moment. Praise God. And then Reggie Dodd stood up. And when he stood up, I just went like this. Because I knew he was going to stand. He stood up and he had it. Praise God. So he had the interpretation. So it can happen. It doesn't have to be in front of a group of people. Three or four of you together, you can, get a, you can have a prophecy. You can get a divers of tongues. But divers of tongues is always for interpretation. And so when you have divers of tongues that comes, it is always to be interpreted. And the divers of tongues given with the interpretation together equal prophecy. So it's the same as what would happen if someone just said it of God by the utterance and in the known natural language at the moment. It's the same thing. An interpretation of tongues is an interpretation. It's not a translation. And you need to know that. So what comes from the Spirit, and I say that because, you know, sometimes if you're, if you're not real new at this, most of the time you don't get the whole thing, do you, Reggie? I mean, you have to step out on faith and you're like, oh, no. And Reggie came up to me afterward and he's like, I'm like, it was perfect. I knew you had it. It was perfect. Spot on. 
Okay? So you don't get the whole thing. It's not like you get to play it in your head and then it's, there's that element of just stepping out in faith. You might have one word. You just might have an unction. But you, you got to go with it. you got to get it out. But the interpretation is a, not a translation. It's not word for word. So you're not sitting there listening going, okay, now, what's that? Okay, let me, no, 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 no. It's just, it's just an interpretation. So, I mean, the divers of tongues could go on for a whole solid minute and you get up and say, boom, boom, boom. And that'd be sufficient. So, so don't try to equate, well, God, they had a whole bunch of words in tongues. And that person said three words. They must have missed something. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's just an interpretation. Praise God. So these are not being gifted with special languages. They're not being gifted with the ability to interpret. There's all kind of examples of this happening. We could go on for days and days and days, but it's pretty, pretty calm. We see, you see that a lot here. I mean, we prophesy some. We, we operate in tongues and interpretation quite a bit. So hopefully you have a you have a good knowledge of how that works and what that is. But it is a divine utterance, okay? And so, again, you know, this is why it takes your faith, you know, to step out with these things. It takes you do knowing a little, a little bit about it. It takes, And that's why, thank God that they don't have to be in the public assembly where everybody can hear. Because, you know, we are, we are learning. We are growing in these things. You're not going to maybe every single time hit it quite perfectly, you know. You might, you might, after you say it, realize that I've heard people start out prophesying and know it was of the Spirit of God and then they got caught up with it and walked right out of prophecy from God right into their soul. And it, you can, I can feel it. I mean, when they're in the Spirit versus when they, they step into the natural things. You know, that's okay. That's all right. Praise the Lord. It's okay. We got to practice. We are practicing, right? We are practicing. Praise the Lord. We're practicing. Come on, folks. We're practicing. You know, God does things with us on a graduated basis. There, there are steps for us to take. We grow into things. We progress. And listen, no matter how long you've been at this, and no matter how much, how much you've done it, you're, we're still progressing. I mean, Paul, at the end of his ministry, was still, he said, I'm still determined to progress to more, more and more, to know Jesus more, to know the Holy Spirit more. He was pressing on. So we've got to press into discovering and developing and, and deploying the gifts in us. God wants to use us. I guarantee you He wants to use all of us. And us learning to yield to the Holy Ghost. If you're not faithful with your leadings, chances are you're not going to really function as much as you should in the gifts because you have to know the Holy Ghost. You do have to be able to step out. You do have to know when there's a leading with peace or, or not. You have to know these things. It will help you connect and be able to let the gifts of God flow through you. Also remember, I don't think I've mentioned this in the this, in this section. I did mention in part one uh, about character development, which is very important. But I will say this, that uh, holiness uh, affects the vessel. And the gifts are coming through the vessel. So the purer the vessel, the purer the gift. So that ought to give us all something to aim for. Amen? That was partly why Jesus had such a, just, you know, could just hear God so clearly, could just, because he was just pure. He didn't have anything. I mean, we know, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the mercy of God. And we can get forgiven at any moment. But, boy, just to, just to live right to the best of our ability so that when you are at the grocery store and something happens, your first thought is like, wow, oh gosh, you know, I, I messed up yesterday. You know, no, let's just live clean. Let's live right. And let's let the gifts of God flow through us. Amen. It's only really as we discover our gifts, as we develop in these, and we're able to use these that we really step into uh, what God has for us. I mean, it, it opens the door uh, for us to fully experience the kingdom because we are all, listen, listen, we are all ambassadors of Christ. We are all workers for God. We, we all are to be flowing in the gifts and ministering supernatural life and healing and things to people everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. So remember, these, these are not only to function inside the four walls of the church. 
All right, you don't, and you don't need a platform for them. Motive of your heart is strictly, I, I want to, I want to bless people, man. I want to help people, and so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be the one. I'm gonna be open to God, and I'm gonna be the one that God can use, no matter where, where I go and what I do. And I know that in that, God will be well pleased. Okay, so it's not time. These are not days to just be sitting, sitting back on our heels and thinking. You know, let, let the other people do that. You know, the Bible says that we're, we all come with a supply. We all have a gift. And God puts us in and joins us together so that it all works together. And I always say that, you know, in church and in, even in Houston, God has placed believers in Houston. And if we will all step into what God has put in us, we can effectively get all of the kingdom work done in Houston. Rather than someone over here, you know, you got two people. I'm not, I'm, let me just, you know. But you got two people in the whole section. Everybody else is kind of like, well, you know. So these two people are trying to work everything, function everything, do everything so that the job can get done. But what would happen if everybody just stepped into their place and began to do what they were supposed to do. Man, it would just it would just go. It would just flow. It would just be so God. Seriously. I mean, I sit here and I look out and I think I think there are a bunch of miracle working. There are a bunch of devil casting out people. Right here in this room. I mean, the power that's in this room, the gifts that are in this room. Some of them just lying dormant for years, just waiting for you to get up and do something with it. This is the time, church. This is the time. Get up and do something with it. Get up and do something with what you've got, and then you'll get more of something to do something else with, praise God. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.